for EIS. I am a technician for on contract for Bonneville Power Administration. And what was your background uh, before taking on that employment? I did various positions, retail management, uh, as a broker. Um, prior to that, I was in the military as a medic with the uh, United States Army. How long did you serve in the Army? Uh, roughly four years. Got a little early for good behavior, basically. So when we came out of Desert Storm, they allowed some people to leave, and uh, I took the opportunity to leave a little early. All right. You mentioned the Desert Storm, so mm -hmm. I assume uh, Uncle Sam sent you overseas. That's correct. And how long were you overseas? Roughly nine months to a year. And were you uh, in an area that was seeing uh, combat? Did you, did you see medical emergencies? Yes, I was dispatched out. Um, I was kind of like the crew chief for my, for my group. So I was dispatched out with an ambulance, and my job was to support various units that were deployed out in the desert. And so I provided medical attention to the, the soldiers that were out in the desert. And then during combat, uh, we set up a forward mash unit, and so I provided uh, medical attention to POWs and the American soldiers that were wounded as well. Is an Army medic uh, like, a, like a paramedic, or is it different? It's different. Um, there are some differences. Uh, a paramedic isn't being shot at. Um, paramedics generally don't run towards explosions, so they're not first on the scene. Uh, usually they're escorted. I was both. Uh, in my civilian life, uh, or, or what I call my civilian life, weekends, I worked at uh, Womack Army Hospital and drove ambulance as well. And so it's a bit of a difference. You'd have the police that would clear the area, um, take that risk. And then you would come in and, and provide support and help the patient. And the military, you're there um, in the thick of it. So you not only help the patient, but you have to be aware of what's going on around you as well. You don't want to become a victim yourself or, or uh, targeted yourself. So there's a certain amount of awareness to what's going on. It's, it's not just run up and grab somebody and you're safe and you're helping somebody. You're, you have to make sure that it's not an ongoing threat at the same time. So you have to assess your environment. Um, when it's happening and before it happens and at all times. So there's a certain amount of awareness in your environment. It's, it's, it sticks with you, basically. That's what it does. Let me ask you about the events of May 26th, 2017. Mm -hmm. uh, were you on the Green Line MAX train on that day? I was. And where did you board the MAX? I, I jump on where the Lloyd Center is, Holiday Park. BPA building is right there, so it's easy transport for me to jump on. Uh, it helps me to save money. Parking is the very expensive. It's about $150 a month, so I chose not to do that. All right. And it sounds like you were a regular commuter on that on that max train. About three years at that point, I believe. Yeah. All right. And when you boarded the train at the Lloyd Center stop, uh, do you remember about uh, where you took a seat I generally stand. I like to stand. Um, I don't. I like to have the door to my back, and I like to be able to see both ends of the train and all the entrances and exits. It's just kind of a habit for me. Um, so I walked in about the mid portion of the train, and then stood. Um, I, I believe I have my headphones on. One of the things I like to do is I have my headphones on. I'm not listening to anything, but it prevents people from engaging me. And then it allows me to hear what's going on around me. So, it sounds like you just want to be left alone and ride the, the max to your destination. If you knew what I did for a living, you understand the quiet. It's kind of nice. Yeah, <clears throat> definitely. When did you first notice something unusual happening on that max trail? Immediately. Immediately. Mm -hmm. What did you notice? Um, well, there's a lot of yelling. Uh, Mostly racist comments, uh, mixed with political statements, um, provocative behaviors, uh, th 
things that you would say if you wanted to provoke a response, I guess, is what you're saying. What, do you remember uh, any of the exact uh, words that you heard? Um, I remember hearing the word faggot, uh, nigger. Uh, I remember hearing them say, uh, I pay taxes, you don't. Uh, get the fuck out of my country. Um, Muslims, conversations about Muslims, uh, beheadings, I should cut your fucking head off. Things that you don't generally say in a, in a conversation that you're trying to be productive and, and uh, get some cultural awareness of, let's say. So um, it brought the hairs up on the back of my neck simply because um, I have a pretty diverse relationship uh, pool. And if you were to approach some of the men that I've served with with that attitude, uh, you would be opening up a can of worms. And uh, so for me, it was more of a, why would someone say this in a crowded train? I remember looking up and seeing an African-American man standing there who was rather large, wearing a Marine cap, which is a statement in and of itself. And Jeremy was pretty close to him. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. He must be pretty confident with himself to be saying things like that, surrounded with this crowd. And so that's where the kind of hairs on my back of my neck went up. I was like, well, you must feel pretty comfortable. You might have a plan, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, an ace up your sleeve uh, to have that kind of attitude, a flippant attitude in that group. So I stayed where I was and just kind of monitored what was going on. Uh, I think at that point I pretty much wasn't interested in what's going on on my phone or anything else. Um, I was more interested on the other to train what was going on. Um, and it did get louder and louder, so, you know, it kind of, not kind of, it absolutely made me nervous. You know, I, I figured someone's going to light up at that point. I just wasn't sure when. My hope was we'd ride it out to Hollywood and he'd get off. So. You mentioned the name. <coughs> What's that? You mentioned the name Jeremy. So is that Jeremy Christian? Yes. I didn't know his name at the time. Of course. And that's yeah. what I was going to ask you. So at the time, you, you didn't know who this person was. No, could absolutely you, not. Could you see this person making the remarks that you just Yeah, I saw him, him and his body language. And he, he was up and chest out. And Do you see this person in the courtroom now? Yes. And can you point him out to the jury? He's sitting right there. So identifying the person seated between the two men in suits at the table, about, and I, I know you didn't have, a, obviously, a measuring tape or a laser to measure the distance, but, but about how far, in terms of rows, if you remember, were you standing from where Jeremy Christian was seated on the max? Uh, from me to you a little bit further, maybe. And so, I gather the next train is, is moving, it's heading east from Lloyd Center to the Hollywood That's correct. platform. It's, it's, it's doing its thing. It's, 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 there wasn't any abnormal delays on the right. and stops, it was just moving along. All right. And so, you, you said to the jury that uh, you're watching this happening. Listening to these words, mm -hmm. uh, what, what happens? Well, a lot of things happen. Um, I remember the driver telling him to sit down and be quiet, or they would call the police. And I remember him stopping instantly, sitting down, and then getting back up again, which I thought was odd. I have, teenage boy, I have a teenage boy and a younger child. When they get riled up and I tell them to stop, they don't react that quickly. So it's odd to me that he would react that quickly and sit down, but then he hopped back up again. Um, and then they went at it again. They started arguing again. Uh, Who's they? Oh, Jeremy and, and whoever he was yelling at, which is pretty much everybody in that half of the train within distance of his voice. Because he, he made kind of a roundabout. He looked at anybody who was different than him and singled them out. Um, anybody he thought was of a particular religion, uh, Muslim or not, um, made a comment to him. So it's more about how can I get this 
how can I get this party started, basically? You know, how can I get people worked up? And that's what he did. He went around and, and made his comments, and, and it kept going. Uh, people would say something, you shouldn't say things like that. And he'd say the most abrasive thing he possibly could to offend them, uh, to get a reaction. And, and, and that's what was going on at the time. Um, I, was, I don't know the names of the people that were up there at the time, so I can't tell you that Micah stood up and walked over. I can tell you that the gen a gentleman stood up and put himself between him and the girls that he was uh, threatening. Um, I was immediately concerned for him. Uh, Rick Best and I were looking at each other. Uh, Rick, I've talked to before on the train, ex-military. Uh, we just have a way of noticing each other. Um, you can put people in the room that are ex-military and immediately will ask each other where you served. It's just a thing. So we made eye contact and uh, we both had an, uh, kind of an alarmed look on our face. The, the gentleman who was the Marine um, was pushing the button constantly for the driver. Um, if I could just interrupt you for a second. Did you mm -hmm. mention Mr. Rick Bess? That's correct. Uh -huh. And you said that you knew him. Had you met him as a daily commuter on the map? Yes, right? yes. Yeah. So that's how you knew him? Mm -hmm. And uh, because was he just like you had the same schedule after him? I don't know what his schedule was. I'd seen him not every day, but I'd seen him, you know, every, every once in a while I'd see him. And we were, honestly didn't sit down and have conversations. Like I said, I generally like to keep to myself. I read a lot. Uh, current affairs, I'd recommend it for people so they can learn you know, about cultures and things. And but you knew he, he was an uh, ex-Army. I did, yeah. We had talked about his service, and uh, I was impressed with his long service and tenure. And how, how, uh, how near or far away were you? Oh, I'd say about 20 feet about 20 at that, feet. yeah. So, um, so you saw him that day. Did you have a conversation with him that day? Not at all. Um, it was more of a an understanding, kind of a nod to each other, kind of like we knew. Um, same reason that Marine knew. And there's a sixth sense that you have. You just know that something's good, good about to click off. And so we made that eye contact and kind of nodded. My, I was hoping that he wouldn't... Uh, how can I describe this? I was hoping he wouldn't get up and walk to the end of the train. Excuse me, sir. Judge, I'm going to object and move to strike testimony that refers to knowing the state of mind of another person. Um, I will uh, sustain that objection. Okay. So, um, and move to strike. And you're talking about the specific last sentence. That's correct. Okay. Uh, so the last sentence um, uh, regarding state of mind of another person should be disregarded and not considered by you as evidence. Okay. Thank you, Judge. And Mr. Newton, do you understand the, the judges? I do. You do? Right. Okay. Great. I mean, when I say that we had an understanding, we, Excuse me, we communicate with our heads. So that's okay, what I'm so um, I'll sustain the objection. So right. that's your next question. So just, right. Right, just tell mm -hmm. us what you, what we you gestured. And what you thought. We gestured to each other, and that was it. Okay. okay. Uh, so you mentioned, uh, I believe you mentioned the passenger going up to Jeremy Krishna at some point, is that right? Are you talking about when Tilly walked up well, towards him? It, yes, at, okay. at the time, of course, you didn't know this. I didn't know his name at the time. He was on the cell phone with somebody talking. He seemed very happy. Um, my, my thought to myself when I saw him was that uh, he was a put to, he's very put together, looked very nice, had a great smile, um, very handsome. And uh, so... Did you so, object to the characterizations? Um, not relevant, I'll sustain the objection. He was a human being standing there that was attractive. <laughs> and so I looked at him because he's in my area. Like I said, I like to know what's going on around me. And he seemed very nice. And he was on his cell phone. And I looked away a little bit, and then he zipped right on past me. And I. He, sorry, he walked past you. He walked past me. Uh, my instinct was to grab him and stop him, but I couldn't. He was gone. He walked in the end of the train. Uh, what his intentions were, I don't know. Uh, did you, could you see what he did? Uh, he held up his cell phone and pointed at uh, Jeremy. And what happened then? Jeremy knocked the cell phone out of his hand. And then... Could you hear that happen? Did you see oh, yeah. Happen? Yeah, it was a pretty solid hit. Uh, obviously, Jeremy wasn't happy with that. Um, I know that my... I, not my... I know that he said something to him when he held the phone up. I was too far away to hear that because I don't think he yelled it or anything. He just said it. 
phone was knocked out, and then, you know, people leaned in, and things happened. All right. Yeah, to the best of your ability, mm -hmm. can you describe for the members of the jury what you saw happen after Jeremy Christian threw that phone to the ground? Well, uh, there was a hey. Someone objected to it. Um, then it looked to me like Jeremy punched, started punching them. Um, I saw, uh, be prior to that, when Tilly uh, walked up there, uh, Rick Best stood up and started walking that direction. Um, I didn't, you know, I, I don't know what his intentions were either, other than he just started walking up towards the train. And he arrived, and uh, Jeremy came out, and I thought they were punching each other. Someone screamed, he's stabbing them. Um, I saw someone flipped. I believe it was uh, Rick uh, was flipped sideways, and Jeremy was on, on him. And people were screaming, and there was mayhem. And, and um, my first instinct was to keep con eye contact and watch Jeremy to see what he was going to do. Uh, Can I ask you, just mm -hmm. again, uh, just in terms of what you saw, mm -hmm. did you ever see Ricky Best fighting with Jeremy Christian? And by fighting, I mean no. punching no. or wrestling? I did not. Putting him in a hole? No. No? No. I mean, it, it, he... Sir, sir, let me, mm -hmm. just if I may, were you in a position that you would have been able to see that if Ricky Best was putting Jeremy Christian in some kind of wrestling hold or punching him or fighting him? Yes. And he did not do that? No. What happened to Ricky Best? He was stabbed. I mean, he was stabbed. Just like the other, uh, just like Tilly was. And how did you know those two men had been stabbed? Uh, because they were bleeding profusely, arterially. The same arterial bleed you get when a soldier gets shot and maimed. Uh, arm blown off, leg blown off, shot in the leg, thigh, anywhere that there's an artery that can be severed. What, what, made, you, what made you think it was arterial bleeding? Color specific? of the blood, how forceful it was, reaction of the person. Everybody reacts differently. This is not, oh man. This is not something you can explain to a civilian who's never been in service and has not seen something like that. A human being knows. It's reactionary. It's instinctual. A human being knows when they're morally wounded. There's no question in my mind. You see it in their eyes and their behavior, the way they carry themselves. So you yourself, as a human being, sense it differently. It's, it's the reason why when kids fall down and hurt themselves and the mother goes, oh, you'll be okay. It, it's just an instinctual thing, and so seeing them, I knew instantly. I, holding their neck, and you can tell. I mean, you just know. You thought both men would die. Absolutely, no question in my mind. And what did they do? Uh, realization. I mean, but meaning, were they standing or were they lying down? What Trying to get out of the area. That's what people do. You, it's a natural instinct to get away from the danger. They walked away from it. At some point, I. Position myself between the train, with train in between me, and to keep an eye on Jeremy and keep an eye on where he w was. I didn't want him walking down towards the end of the train uh, with other people there. People were flooding out of the train. He stood there and said, Who's next? And left the train, got into a confrontation with the very large Marine gentleman who was standing there, threw him up against the train, ran up the stairs, and uh, hightailed it out of there. Um, there was a Muslim woman. I, I, I'm making an assumption she's Muslim. She had the head, uh, head cover on. I stepped out of the train and stopped her from getting on the train. I was afraid that he would make eye contact with her and possibly go after her. Um, and once she was safe and stayed out of it and he was gone, I went back in and started providing medical attention. Um, I looked over at Ricky. Rick was in, you know, gasping for air forcefully. Um, laying on his side, and um, Tilly was in shock. So I just did what I would normally do in that situation, is just render help.
and try and help them. All right. I'm going to show you what the market states exhibit number 53 and ask you if you recognize what's in this photograph. Yeah. What, is, what does this show? Uh, well, Ricky Best laying down and me standing in the back of the train looking up, kind of assessing what's going on. All right. All right. The state moves to admit exhibit 53. There's no objection. Okay, 53 is admitted. And so, sir, is that you standing uh, sort of just behind the two other men that are leaning yes. down on the floor of the max? I had a goatee at the time, and I'm wearing a maroon shirt that I own. All right. And is that... The body of Ricky Best. It is. Very difficult to see the line on the floor. Yes, it is. All right. So, did you uh, use essentially a, a triage type concept or thinking in assessing who you would give uh, assistance to at, at this point? Yes. And what, what does that mean when you use that term triage? You assess the injuries and you help the people that you can help. Did you believe that Ricky Best? based on your assessment, that could be saved? No. Um, I can't... There's a breathing pattern that a person goes into when they are no longer in control of their body, where the brain takes over and starts to um, take over respiration to save itself. And Ricky was in that state. He was hyperventilating forcefully to get as much oxygen as he possibly could and was making no eye contact. Um, There's no movement in his body. There's no expression. Uh, the, the color was leaving his body. So um, he was expiring uh, rapidly, very fast. Now, and I just want to clarify rapidly for people here in this to understand. When I mean rapidly, waves of his blood were running down the aisle towards me. Like you would see when a wave finishes hitting the ocean, the, the sand bar. It was lapping down the aisle. So I knew every time his heart beat that he was bleeding to death. So that's why I didn't do anything to go over and assist. Because I was trying to save the young man in front of me was desperately trying to survive. And so that's what I focused on. I'm going to show you Ms. Mark Steve's exhibit number 75, Mr. Noonan, and ask you if you can identify this. Yes. I've got my hand on his leg and I'm trying I'm getting ready to roll him because he can't breathe anymore. And when you say him, is this the man later identified as Talisha yes, Nankameche? that's correct. And Macy's to my right. Macy's maintaining pressure on his neck. I, I had reached over prior to that and told her to use more force because he was trying to breathe and he couldn't breathe anymore. And so I needed him to clear his airway. Your Honor, the state is moving to admit Exhibit 75. Okay. 75 is admitted. During that period of time, I was calming him down and trying to slow down his, his heart rate and his breathing until what seemed like an eternity, the police officers and the first responders showed up. So these photos that we've seen, uh, this Exhibit 75 that we're seeing now, the previous exhibit, uh, which is 53, those were taken before any police officers or paramedics or firefighters arrived at the scene. That's correct. That correct then? That's correct. All right. This is, this is after I'd already assessed all those injuries. And one of the first things you want to make sure is that you're not attending to a wound that isn't actually the one that you need to be concerned about. In other words, if someone were to get a small injury um, and you were to uh, pay attention to that and you didn't notice a larger exit wound or a defensive injury of some sort that could expedite a person's uh, passing, uh, then, you know, that's the first thing you want to make sure that you do. You understand of where he's been injured and 
and uh, address those injuries. In, in this photo, it, it looks as if the clothing of Mr. Antonici is covered in blood. Uh, were you able to tell where he was wounded? He had a defensive wound on his hand. I noticed that. Um, and he had uh, an injury on his neck. Um, it had penetrated his trach as well, which is why he's spitting up blood. Were you able to stop the bleeding? There's no way. Did, did you have any belief, uh, and I realize you're not a medical doctor, but based on your training experience, did you have any belief that you'd be able to save his life? Thank you for coming to court today. I realize that testifying in court may be difficult, especially on this subject matter. I just want to ask you a couple questions about observations that you made on the train. And the first question I'll ask, even before that, is you spoke to law enforcement people on a previous occasion. Uh, I'll say between today's date and the events that you testified about. Is that right? Correct. Um, in fact, you were interviewed by at least one detective, a person named Detective Brian Speed. Do you remember that? I do. And when that interview took place, did, did you know if they recorded the interview? Mm, he told me he was recording it. He told you mm -hmm. he was recording it. And have you ever had a chance to listen to that recording or read a transcript? I read a transcript, but I, don't, I didn't listen to it. I'm just going to ask you a couple questions about things that you saw uh, that day on the train. And one thing which I, I think you mentioned today is that there was already an argument going on when you got on the train. In other words, you got on the train, it started to move, and you had already noticed there was an argument or some kind of verbal commotion taking place. Is that right? There was verbal communication going on, yes. Understood. And you um, knew that this person, who you now know as Jeremy Christian, was insulting everybody. Is that right? He was insulting pretty much everybody that he was around, yeah. So when you were talking to the detectives, you said, so he started insulting everybody, and then you went on to say, uh, he talked about uh, ISIS and blacks and Hispanics and gay people and, you know, anything he could do to cause a reaction. Does that sound like what you said? Yes. And then also you said, you could tell from his behavior that he was trying to provoke that sound like, yes. That sound like mm -hmm. And you based that not only on things that he was saying incessantly, but upon his body language. That's correct. In fact, you described him, and you alluded to this today, uh, as a person who would stand up, look around the train, scream at the top of his lungs, yell freedom of speech, and then look around to see if anybody was looking at him, and then would go back to yelling at people and insulting people on the train. That's correct.
today uh, and, and on a previous occasion, you said you heard Mr. Christian say, I'll cut your fucking heads off. Is that correct? To that extent, yes. Uh, I, it's, it's been two and a half years. I know that he said he's going to cut their heads off. I don't know if he said, I'll cut your fucking heads off. But the statement of cutting their heads off was definitely made. Fair enough. And he also, while on the train, was screaming about the fact that he paid taxes and Mexicans didn't. He said he paid taxes, they didn't get off my fucking train, and basically. When you say they, he referred specifically to Mexicans. I don't know if he's referring to Mexicans or anybody else who's standing around them that wasn't white. I'm just saying that the next diatribe that he went off on immediately after that was Mexicans. Okay, when you were talking to the detective, does, it, does this sound like an accurate recollection of what you said to the detective? After he said, I'll cut your fucking heads off, you know, blah, 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 uh, screamed about the fact that he paid <coughs> taxes and Mexicans didn't, and get off my fucking train and freedom of speech and all this other stuff. Yes. Do you remember telling the detective that the two girls that were sitting on the train were telling Mr. Christian to be quiet, were saying, leave us alone? Yes. And, Please stop. Leave us alone. And your uh, further statement was, after hearing that comment, Mr. Christian said, oh, I should cut your fucking heads off. Yes. Around that time. you saw Mr. Christian attacking people, uh, you felt that that was something that he learned how to do, and you earlier indicated whether in prison or some other way. Is that right? They're precise attacks, yes. And you specifically, when talking to the detective, mentioned that he could have learned how to do that in prison. He could have. I'm not a prison guard, I'm not an expert in that area, but that's somewhere you could have learned something like that. Did you see people trying to raise the legs of Mr. Best while he was laying on the ground? Absolutely. Their reaction to my comment to them was that they were trying to get blood to his, to his head. And that didn't make sense to you, did it? Absolutely not. It may not have mattered, unfortunately. Hey, no. That didn't make sense. No. Not everybody has combat training, so there's different understanding of how to treat people that have been injured. So I have a little bit of an advantage in that situation, I think. I Your impression was that although Mr. Christian talked about and said insulting things about gays, Mexicans, blacks, and Muslims, uh, you didn't once hear him say something like, hey, you white guy sitting over there. Is that right? No, I did not. You talked a little bit about what it would take to provoke you yourself into anger. Do you remember that? No. Do you remember saying, I mean, you literally have to walk over and lay your hands on me, and then if you do lay your hands on me, it's got to be 
pretty brutal for me to react to it. Does that sound That's better? probably an accurate statement. Yeah. That's the last thing I resort to in any situation is bodily harm to another human being. You've also indicated that Mr. Christian was pushing buttons, and I want to make sure that we're clear here. We know there was a person on the train that was pushing a train button. Correct. But Mr. Christian was also pushing buttons by provoking everyone. Is that fair to say? He was fishing for a reaction, yes. Do you feel that he was personally provoking as many people as he could? Yes. And you feel that it didn't matter who it was, whether they were saying anything back, whether they were black or any other color? It's my impression that he was baiting people to make physical contact with them so he could retaliate. Was he switching from one subject to another? It depended on what the reaction was from the people around him. If he made a comment about somebody who was African American and an African American person said something in return, then he would target that person. If multiple people said, oh my God, and reacted to it, then he would attack the people that reacted to it. It was, it was, he aimed those, those comments with laser accuracy based on people's reactions. Beyond that, there was no flow to his conversation, right? I disagree. Well, do you remember telling the detective when you were interviewed this statement? It didn't matter who it was, whether they were saying anything back, if they were black or any other color, and he was from one subject to another. He would go from Muslims to not paying taxes to uh, Mexicans to, I mean, there was just no flow to his conversation. It was just him attacking people and then screaming freedom of speech. Did you say that? Yes. But there's a reason why I said that. And what's the reason? Was it if accurate? I, if it, it's accurate, but if I tell somebody who's African American that they're the N word, and then I look at somebody else who's reacting to something I said earlier about being Hispanic, and the Hispanic person reacts at the same time the African American does, that conversation goes by very quickly. He's addressing multiple people at the same time as they're re reacting to him. Some people don't react right away. Some people wait for one or two or three responses or comments before they say something. Some people have different tolerance levels. I have an, an amazing tolerance level. I have an African-American son. He's mixed, but he'll always be black because the skin's dark. I react differently than other people who may be white because I know the ramifications of that. So when I say that, I'm speaking from experience. People, based on their life experiences, react differently in situations. They might have a tolerance that's a little bit higher. African Americans have a much higher tolerance than we do in situations because they have a different, there's different ramifications to what will happen if they respond. So sometimes they wait, like my son, two or three comments before he says something. It I doesn't, totally so understand. that's why he was jumping around and saying things. Someone who was called gay at one point and then called gay at another point may build up enough courage to say something while he says something, so he's firing rapidly off back and forth. Most people might consider that crazy and non sequitur, and it, that's what I mean. It doesn't, there's not a lot of flow to it. The flow's being controlled by the people who are responding, and he's reacting to them, so it's reactionary. And people may have different reaction times, as you just pointed out. That would be correct. Um, but you have no doubt that it was Mr. Christian's goal to stir the pot. There was no question There's no in question mind. in my mind. Like I said, I've had experience with it. I know the difference. Did he say things like, you can't stop me from saying whatever I want to say? He said freedom of speech. I can say whatever I want to say. And in fact... And he, he, said, would, he said that while he was looking down the train in fact, towards he, me. He yeah. said freedom of speech several times. Certainly. He didn't strike you as a rational person, did he? I'm not a psychologist. I wouldn't be able to answer that question accurately. Do you remember telling the detective that Mr. Christian wasn't uh, rational in any way? I may have said that at some point. Again, I'm not a psychologist, so I could be misspeaking. I don't know. I understand.
Thank you. I do not have any other questions. Uh, I do have a few questions that were raised by Mr. Yes. Schultz. We do, uh, I think we are, I was going to give a break right after your redirect, but we can take a break right now. Okay, thank you, Judge. Okay. Um,